So today I'm going to talk about estimators. And the idea of estimators is as follows. Uh, we are observing some random variables. So we are observing the temperature of this room. And uh, you know, typically every random variable has a mean and a covariance, of course, and it also has a distribution. But the unfortunate reality is many a times we don't quite know what the mean and the covariance is. As a result of which we need to estimate it from the data itself. So I'm observing the temperature of this particular room. I don't know what the true mean and the true covariance of the temperature of this room is. So as I'm reading the data, I want to be able to uh, process that data in order to figure out what is the mean and the covariance. So right now we are only going to look at mean, in today's class, we are to looking at the mean and the covariance as things that we want to estimate. And very soon when we talk about hypothesis testing, uh, next class uh, Wednesday onwards, uh, we look at more complicated functions of the random variables that we would like to estimate, okay? So right now it's very simple. The simple setting is I am observing y1 to yn. These are all random variables which has a known distribution, which has a unknown, well, let me, these are Gaussian with mean mu and covariance sigma square. So right now we are, I'm putting it as a Gaussian distribution, but you can pick any other distribution. Uh, it's completely fine. And this is uh, mean mu, uh, sig uh, variance sigma square. Mu is unknown. Sigma square is unknown. Uh, what else do we know? And these are IID. These are independent. And identically distributed. So independent means that Y2 has no correlation with Y1. Y3 has no correlation with Y2 and Y1. Y4 has no correlation with Y3, Y2 and Y1 and so on and so forth. So that means independent. They are all independent of each other. These are independent observations and identically distributed, which means that their distributions are exactly the same. They are all Gaussian with mean mu and covariance sigma square. Now let's try to think about it. I'm measuring the temperature of this room. So Y1 is the temperature at 3 p.m. Y2 is temperature at 3.01 p.m. Y3 is the temperature at 3.02 p.m. and so on and so forth. Are they independent? Are they independent of each other? Is Y2, is there any correlation between the temperature of this room at 3.01 p.m. and 3 p.m.? What do you expect the temperature to be, the readings to be, Y2 and Y1 to be? <clears throat> yeah. They'll probably be the same, right? So Y1 and Y2 will probably be the same. Same thing with Y3 and Y2. Maybe there is a little bit of fluctuation, but it's kind of sort of going to look the same. As a result of which, if you look at the temperature of this room, it's not really independent. Are they identically distributed? Do they have the same distribution? Would Y1 and Y2 have the same distribution? They probably have the same distribution because it's the same room, the same number of people, the same set of materials that are inside the room. So all in all, we have uh, the situation inside the room is not really changing between 3 p.m. and 3.01 p.m. or 3.02 p.m. So they are identically distributed. Now at 4 p.m., a new class is going to start. In this particular class, we have three people in the room. When that class starts, there'll be 20 people in the room or 25 people in the room, right? They might be using some projector. They might be turning on this projector. They might be running some presentation. So the com computer will also get used. At that point of time, would the 
temperature, so I'm looking at the temperature at 345 p.m., 355 p.m. So 355 is when this class ends and then 4 p.m. when the next class starts. So I'm looking at these three temperature. Uh, in this particular, so if you look at this time, it is the same class happening and the same class is happening at 3.55 p.m. There is no difference. Therefore, these two temperature will be identically distributed. They won't be independent, but they will be identically distributed. But if you look at the temperature here and the temperature here, they will be non-identically distributed. They'll have different distributions because things are going to change at 4 p.m. There'll be 20 people in the room, the projector will be getting used, the computer will be getting used, as a result of which the distribution of the temperature is going to change at that point of time. Okay. Uh, so let's say you go to Kroger, I mean, I don't know, whatever is your favorite grocery store, and that particular grocery store is looking at how much each of their customers are spending uh, in an entire month, so in the month of September, in the month of October, in the month of December, and so on. If you look at all the, cus the, the customer data, and if you look at the spend of the customer in that particular store at a specific month, are they independent? Are they independent? Is your grocery shopping independent of my grocery shopping behavior at that store? What do you think? Yes. I think there will probably be some dependence just because of like how much stuff you need to eat compared to pretty similar. Uh, plus like the... But what is the thing that will correlate the two variables? Maybe this month I decide not to go to Kroger. I, I go to Whole Foods this particular month for all my grocery needs. Something has to correlate the two readings. So my grocery shopping behavior and your grocery shopping behavior has to be correlated because of some event that might be happening in our life, right? So it turns out that in that case, the two events are completely independent. So my shopping behavior is completely independent of your shopping behavior. Okay, because we two are completely different individuals. Now, if we happen to be uh, in the same household, then again, the shopping behavior will get correlated. If we happen to have some weather event that might be happening, let's say, you know, like right now in Florida, there is a hurricane landing in Florida. So that is going to correlate everyone's shopping behavior, right? So everybody is going to buy supplies and this and that. As a result of which their, their expenditure behavior is going to co get correlated. But otherwise, if you look at a generic month, uh, the shopping amount that you, like the amount you spend in Kroger and the amount I spend in Kroger, they're actually completely independent. Are they identically distributed? So there are two ways to think about it, okay? Are they identically distributed or not? So, you can think about it from a human perspective. You are a human being, I'm a human being, so maybe our, uh, our distributions, like our expenditures, will be identically distributed. But you can think about it from a segmentation perspective as well. So I'm a person with a wife and two kids. You might be a person without any family. As a result of which, your distribution will not be identical to my distribution of shopping. Maybe my average shopping is $300 a month and your shopping is $100 a month, let's say. Right, so they are not identically distributed. So depending on what point of view you are taking, you may have identical distribution or you may not have identical distribution. It really depends on how you, how you view your customer segment in that particular perspective. So I just want to give you a, like a thought, I'm just trying to do a thought experiment here that whenever you see independent and identically distributed, it could just be a, a, an abstraction, an assumption on the system, but need not actually be true. Uh, and this is something that's very, uh, I would say, most of the time this assumption of independent and identically distributed is really good assumption for that particular application. Uh, sometimes this assumption might lead to failures. So you really need to know, and of course, uh, 
the more statistics courses you do, the better you would understand when this will lead to failure and when this will not lead to failure. But uh, in my personal experience, 99% of the cases, this has not led to any problems. But I haven't just encountered the 1% of the place where this would lead to problems. Uh, although I don't make these assumptions in my paper, but as far as the rest of the day-to-day -day life goes, I always assume independent and identically distributed, and I don't really pay a huge price for making that assumption. So just, keeping, uh, just keep that in mind. This is an abstraction. Uh, this is an assumption on what the underlying process is doing. Uh, most of the times, it's a very good assumption to make. Sometimes it could be a bad assumption to make, and so you just need to keep the context in mind uh, when this is a good or a bad assumption to make. Anyways. <clears throat> So now I'm faced with this issue. I'm making this measurement. I'm looking at the temperature of this room at every point of time. Let's say for the sake of argument that the temperature is independent and identically distributed. Uh, I don't know what the mean is. I don't know what the covariance is. Okay. So now I'm given this data set of n uh, variables. Let's assume that all of these are real numbers. For now, uh, we can do it for the vector case as well, basically following the same argument that we'll be making today. Uh, but for now, just assume it's real because then the calculations are much easier to show on the board. I want to estimate the mean. What would be a good estimator for the mean? I want to find the average. I want to find the mean of this particular sequence of random variables. Can someone tell me a good estimator for mean? Mean just means average, right? So mu is just the average. So I can just take the average and I get the mean of the, I get an estimate of the mean of this particular sequence of random variables. And let's say estimate sigma square. And I'm going to write down two different estimators. Okay, so I want to estimate the mean mu. I don't know what mu is. I don't know what sigma square is. I just know that these are Gaussian distributed random variables. They are independent and identically distributed. So one way to estimate mu is just to take the average of all the samples. This is known as sample average. So I take the sample average. I look at the readings of the temperature of this room. Just divided by the number of readings and I get a sample average. If I want to estimate sigma square, I first estimate the mean based on this expression. And then I'm going to subtract from each of the readings. I'm going to subtract the mean, square it, sum it, take the average in one case. And in the other case, I'm not going to take the exact average. I'm going to take n minus 1 in the denominator. So that's the only difference between this and this. 
This one has n in the denominator, this one has n minus 1 in the denominator. Do you all agree that this is a good estimator for the mean? Okay, looks very reasonable. Do you all agree that this is a good estimator for the covariance for sigma square? Do we all agree that this looks okay, but I'm still a bit uncertain about this minus one here. I think average is fine. I understand average. We've all done average all throughout our life. But this n minus one seems a bit fishy here. Why is it fishy? Why, why do we have to have n minus one in the denominator here? So let's look at it. Okay, let's find out which is a good estimator. So now, now we are faced with a question. Is this a good estimator or is this a good estimator? Because this seems like a reasonable estimator, but among these two, which one is a good estimator? What do we mean by good estimator? What is the meaning of a good estimate? Okay. <clears throat> do you know of any other way to estimate mu? Something that you might have studied in the past, something that you might know about. Yes. Um, I've known this applies in this case, but maybe instead of just uh, straight up uh, mean, you could take a harmonic mean. Harmonic mean, okay. So you can take harmonic mean. I don't know much about uh, the properties of harmonic mean, but certainly that's a good idea to explore. What else? Have any of you have heard of this term called median? You know how to take out median of random variables? No? Have, how many of you have seen median before? One, two, oh, so all of you have seen median before, okay? So median could also be a good estimator. I don't know whether it's a good estimator of mean or not, but it's certainly one way to know what the center value of the random variable is. So if I have a random variable as 5, 4, 1, 10, 6, then I have to put it in ascending order. So these are my yi's. So I have to put it in ascending order 1, 4, 5, 6, 10. And then the center point is going to be the median. That's my median. So that also kind of sorts of feel, it feels like a very good estimate for mu as well. So I have two estimators for mean. I have two estimators for covariance. Okay. And if I'm using the median, if I'm computing the median, I can replace this with median right here. And I can compute the sigma square. I can estimate sigma square. So essentially for the same quantity, there are these two are unknown quantities, but for these two unknown quantities, I have multiple estimators. I have this estimator and I have this estimator and I have this estimator and I have this estimator. So now we need to figure out what is a good estimator and what's a bad estimator. Okay. And depending on the, depending on the situation, something that might make sense here may not make sense somewhere else. So let me give you a very concrete example uh, in the context of aerospace uh, system. So, you know, aircraft engines have a lot of temperature sensors throughout the engine, but specifically they have temperature sensors just downstream of the turbines. Exactly after the fuel gets burned, they have like a bunch of temperature sensors there. And there are, of course, they want to know what the temperature of the engine is. Let's say the pilot wants to know what the temperature of the engine is. One way to measure the temperature, and now remember that those temperatures are of the order of 1500 degrees Celsius or 1000 degrees Celsius, okay? So it's not a trivial like 5, 10 degrees Celsius temperature. So I'm looking at a bunch of uh, maybe like 20 temperature sensors there, and I'm getting the numbers like 1001, 1005, 1010, something like that. I'm getting a bunch of readings, right? So I can take the sample average and tell the pilot, look, the temperature seems to be 1005 degrees Celsius, whatever. Now assume that two of the temperature sensors have failed. 
and they have failed and now those readings are zero zero because the temperatures have failed so the sensor is basically reading zero because it cannot read anything else and that's the default value in the software that was written by the temperature sensor guy so you have like a bunch of sensors saying 1000, 1001, 1005, 1010 and here are two sensors saying 00, zero which is a good estimator for the temperature in that case yeah probably median okay so in those case when there is failure you don't want to use this estimator you want to use this estimator as your estimate for the temperature in that particular case so again that's why I was saying that depending on the context this could be a good estimator from you or this could be a good estimator from you and we'll figure out what exactly does that mean that it's a good estimator or a bad estimator so it's going to take us a couple of classes to understand what's a good or a bad estimator okay let's look at what the expected value of y bar n is What is this expected value? This is 1 over n. Okay, so it looks like if I look at the expected value of y bar n, I get exactly equal to mu. Maybe a definition of a good estimator would be if the expected value of the estimator is the same as what we are trying to estimate. Okay, it's a very reasonable definition for what is a good estimator. So the sample average is a good estimator because if I look at the expected value of the estimate, it's actually equal to mu. This is known as an unbiased, where should I write? Maybe I'll write here. This is an unbiased estimate. this is known as an unbiased estimator of the mean sample average is an unbiased estimator of the mean let's look at let's apply the same principle to s tilde n square I want to find out what the expected value of s tilde n square is I want to prove that this is a good estimator So I get 1 over n summation expected value of yi minus y bar square i equals 1 to n. This is 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n yi square I should use y bar n here. perfect so in order to compute this particular expectation I need to compute 
expected value of yi square, I need to compute expected value of y bar n square. I need to compute expected value of yi, y bar n. So let's try to compute this. Expected value of yi square. So generally speaking, when you see a random variable square, this is equal to mu square plus sigma square. You can do it as an exercise or you can look up Wikipedia or any of the other resources, but this is basically mu square plus sigma square. I need y bar n square. Summation ij expected value of yi yj. Okay, maybe I'll write it in a different sentence. What is this expectation going to be? So I'm going to, so yi and yj are independent and identically distributed random variables. So I will have one over n square summation of i expected value of yi square plus one over n square summation of i not equal to j expected value of y i y j. So I'm going to split the expectation into two sets when i is equal to j and when i is not equal to j. Okay, so far so good. Any questions? So I get one over n square, n times mu square plus sigma square, plus one over n square. This is n into n minus one over two. I not equal to j. So I get this times mu square. This is fine. Okay. And then I also need to find out what this value is. So let me erase that side of the board.
I'll pause here for question. So I found out what expected value of yi square is. I have found out what expected value of y bar n square is. And now I need to find out the expected value of this particular part. So this is done, this is done, this one is left. So I need to find out expected value of yi, y bar n. Actually, in some sense, I've already figured it out somewhere here. So let me just write down what the expression is. I want one over n expected value of y i y j summation over all j. This is one over n mu square plus n minus one mu square plus sigma square n minus 1 mu square. So I get <coughs> I have done the hard part. Now I want you to do the easy part. and tell me what this s delta n square looks like. So that's this expression. So I get this from here. I need to get this from this expression. No, I think the expression is right here. This is my one. This gives me one. This gives me two. This is the third part. Now you need to piece together the puzzle and tell me what that looks like. And I hope I have not made any mistakes anywhere. I'll just add a summation as well. mu square plus sigma square plus n plus 1 over 2n mu square plus sigma square over n minus 2 over n n mu square plus sigma square. That's just a lot of addition that we need to do. So let's do it. So I have mu square. Times 3n plus 1 over 2n. minus 2. There is something wrong here. Oh, there should yeah. be n squared. There should be no over 2 term, right? Here? Because if you consider here? Yeah, if you consider n oh. cross n matrix, it should be just n squared minus n terms. 
there is n square minus n terms so i have there shouldn't be any two oh right that's true correct uh because i'm taking everything off the diagonal so i have n n into n minus 1 by 2 terms below the diagonal and n into n minus 1 over 2 terms above the diagonal so this 2 is not here perfect that makes my life easy so i have to remove this 2 from here i have to remove this 2 so what is this number now just mu square plus sigma square over n right yeah. yeah okay perfect mu square plus sigma square over n perfect so anybody understood the error there shouldn't have been a 2 here because we are doing the summation over all i not equal to j awesome So I have one over n. Mu square gets cancelled, and I'm left with summation n plus one sigma square minus two over n sigma square. So I get n minus one over n sigma square. Yeah, this looks correct now. okay every all the steps are clear so if i look at the expected value of s tilde n square which is defined in this particular fashion after doing all the computation i came to realize that actually the expected value is n minus 1 over n sigma square okay what do we expect s tilde n square to be we expect it to be sigma square which is true if i let n go to infinity this particular term converges to 1 and so i get that as n goes to infinity the expected value is equal to sigma square however for finite n finite values of n this is off from sigma square and therefore this is an biased estimate it's a biased so this is an unbiased estimate because the expected value is exactly what we want it to be this is a biased estimate because the expected value is not what we want it to be but in the limit n goes to infinity it does converge to the desired value in the limit n goes to infinity it converges to the desired value but for finite n there is a little bit of error small error 1 over n sigma square that's the error and that's why it's a biased estimate now if i look at the third estimator uh, like the third uh, expression that i had so i'm just going to erase it here and i'm going to write it here n minus 1 over n sigma square this is biased estimate 
if I look at the, th the other estimator, that was 1 over n minus 1, expected value of summation i equals 1 to n, expected value of yi minus y bar n square, that's equal to n minus 1 over n minus 1 sigma square equals to sigma square. So this is an unbiased estimate. Okay, so what happened in today's class so far? So I started with a bunch of random variables. I'm observing IID random variables, independent and identically distributed random variables. I know that they are all Gaussian distributed. I know they have the same mean. I know they have the same covariance. The problem is I don't know what the mean value is and I don't know what the covariance value is. So I, now I need to figure out from the reading can I estimate the mean and the covariance? So we figured out, okay, there are some things that seems reasonable. So this seems a reasonable estimator of the mean. And so we saw that if I take the expected value, it actually is equal to the mean. Therefore, it's an unbiased estimate. We came up with two estimators for the covariance. One is this estimator and the other one is this estimator. And then we realized that this one is actually a biased estimate. It gives you the right value when n goes to infinity, but for finite n, it gives you uh, somewhat uh, different information than what you're looking for. So therefore, this is a biased estimate. This one becomes an unbiased estimator for the covariance because if you look at the expected value, it's exactly equal to the quantity that we want to compute. Okay. We came up with another estimator for the mean, which was median, okay? The median is another estimate for mean. It is called what is known as a robust estimator because if you have outliers because of errors, because of faults, because of attack, you will still be able to get a reasonable estimate of the mean, okay? So median is also a very good estimator and it's always used if you are using a safety critical system, you put a whole bunch of sensors there and then you take the median value, and that gives you a very good estimate. Okay, uh, so now I want to talk about uh, this situation where this n is going to infinity, okay? So we have two results, central limit theorem and law of large numbers. I'm gonna talk about both of these quantities, I mean both these theorems here in the class. I'm not going to talk about the proof, I'm not gonna write those statements precisely. But I want to give you a feel of what it means for these estimates to converge. What exactly does it, what are the mathematical underpinnings or rather uh, convergence of some of these uh, estimators that we are talking about. So central limit theorem So I'm going to define Zn. So I have y, y, I, y1 to Yn Iid. I define Zn to be 1 over square root of n summation of Yi minus mu over sigma square i equals 1 to n. Oh no, not sigma square in the denominator, only sigma.
So the theorem is if for large n, Zn is approximately Gaussian with mean 0 and variance 1. And the law of large numbers Okay, so what is central limit theorem say, telling us? So there are a bunch of independent and identically distributed random variables. I subtract the mean divided by sigma, add it all up, but I'm not taking the average. I'm taking square root of n in the denominator here. Okay, so I'm not taking the average of this. I'm taking square root of n in the denominator. And it turns out that for large enough n, zn, is going to be approximately Gaussian. So if you look at the histogram of Zn, it's going to look like a Gaussian distributed random variable with mean zero and variance one. That's central limit theorem. Law of large number says that if I look at y bar of n, which, had, which we had defined in the previous part, so y bar of n So what we had proved previously was expected value of y bar of n is equal to mu. What I'm saying is actually y bar of n is approximately equal to mu here. So it's not expectation. I'm not writing expectation there. I'm actually saying that y bar of n is actually approximately equal to mu. In reality, the way you write it is that probability of y bar n minus mu is greater than epsilon is less than some delta n and that n, as n goes to infinity, the delta n goes to zero. Okay, that's the right way to write it. But what I'm writing here is y n is approximately equal to mu for large enough n. Now, what is large n? Large n could be 20, could be 100 could be a million and it really depends on the context and the variance that you have in the temperature, I mean in the reading of y1 to yn. So if you look at the, the temperature of this room from 3 o'clock to 4 p.m., 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., uh, there isn't too much variation, okay? So the temperature of the room is kind of sort of fluctuating around the mean. So if we have only 20 readings, we can get a very good estimate of mu because of this law of large number. Um, however, if the temperature is varies quite uh, significantly, 
then 20 samples is not enough to give you knowledge of mu. So to give you an example, going back to the Kroger example we were talking about, if you look at how much money 20 customers are spending in Kroger, and you use that to come up with the mean, it's actually going to be a very bad mean. Because if you look at the number of customers and the variance of customers demand, it's going to be quite large, that variance is quite high, as a result of which uh, 20 customers is not enough, you probably need 200 or 500 customers. Uh, average of 500 customers expense, expense in Kroger in order to get a good estimate of the mean mu. So just something to keep in mind that even though we have not studied what exactly precisely at what value of n these statements hold, just know that this large value, when I say large n, it actually depends on the context. Sometimes large n could be 20 and sometimes large n could be 1 million. So what we have done today, uh, we are at the end of this lecture. So what we have done today, we have learned that there are biased estimate, there are unbiased estimate of things that are unknown. Uh, so the way to estimate the, the way to estimate is look at the readings, transform those readings into some functions and then try to, I, uh, try to estimate, not estimate, try to compute what that function is and you get the estimate of things that you are estimating. So you get some y bar n as an estimate of mu, s tilde n square as an estimate of sigma square. The reason why these estimates are good or bad is because of central limit theorem and law of large numbers. Depending on the context, you might be using one or the other. And basically the idea is that for large enough n, whatever estimator you are using, is actually going to be approximately equal to mu. I mean, uh, approximately equal to uh, the estimate itself, okay? So in this case, y bar n is going to be very close to mu. S tilde n square for large enough value of n is going to be very close to sigma square. Now, what we are going to do then in the next class is we'll talk about hypothesis testing. And the reason why this is important in hypothesis testing is you have a bunch of readings, y1 to yn, and we want to come up with functions of y1 to yn so that we know whether these random variables are coming up uh, are, are of the distribution that we expect it to be or are of a different distribution. And that hypothesis testing is exactly what you want to run when you want to know if there is an attack happening on the system or not. So we'll talk about hypothesis testing, we'll connect it to attack detection algorithms. And then we'll spend maybe the next 10, 15 days talking about various hypothesis testing algorithms and how it affects, how it influences the attack detection strategies in autonomous systems. That's all I have. Uh, and then we'll meet on Monday. Have a great weekend.